taught me how to drive. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> I just told her, you know, if I'm gonna drive, you're gonna you're gonna have to let me drive. <laughs> I'm a good driver though. My dad taught me how to drive. Um, my dad was a cab a taxi cab driver for a long time. Um, he just taught me really direction and so uh, yeah. Yeah. Instagram, Instagram. Okay, all right. We're going to start here shortly. Will you um, also send me a message on um, no, Facebook? I'm, no, I'm going to address it here because it's very long. Oh, God. Amazing. Thank you so much. Usually when I like to address something over Discord or on the phone, that means it's a very long answer. I'm trying to log on to my TikTok account. Oh, sheesh. Come on. Oh, well. Let me hand this to the iPad back. To the I'll just use my little phone here. Okay, bada bing, bada boom. Okay, great. All right. So let me uh, address Sherry's question. What do you mean? Huh. Oh, one of my Facebook accounts. Is, uh, was, it, was this in the chat, Venerable, or no. did she send this message to you? Did she ask this question to you? She sent me a very deep, dark, secret message onto my Facebook Messenger. Wow, I didn't even know about it. I'm just kidding. That it's re fine. That requires... It's probably better I don't know. <laughs> that requires... Uh, I'm kidding. Requires FBI-level clearance to review. I got CIA. <laughs> All right, so... I'm joking. As, uh, all right, so now we're going to start. All of the recordings are on. And before I answer this question, I just want to say that there's another very young, bright, intelligent Vietnamese student that is very young and are asking skeptical questions, questions designed to just wanting to know what's going on with some of these doubts. Usually when people have these questions, they're very curious as to you know, how the Buddha would answer them, and they have doubts in their mind. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, uh, it gives me a lot of headache. But it's a good thing because it keeps my mind, you know, fresh, and it keeps me on point as a teacher, and that we should always be prepared to answer these types of questions. Now, now this other gentleman, who, young man, who sent me these messages, I think that it can now constitute a book. Because with the answers that I have given him, with the amount of questions that he has bombarded me, um, it, it, it literally, it's, it can constitute a book. So that's what's exactly going to happen after the first book will be published. There'll be a second book called Doubts in Buddhism or something like that. I don't know. Um, Especially these questions being directed at an urgent care monk, <laughs> you know, um, that's very unique. But there's nothing that I cannot answer, and if I can't answer it, I'll look it up. So Sherry's question is: So through all my reading and also through the teaching, the, the 
I have three questions. The first question is, and I apologize as this is not related to CBT, but I just wanted to get this out of the way. This is supposed to be reserved for probably tomorrow. Ashley, Sherry, do you want to reserve this for tomorrow since tomorrow is Buddhism? Or are you dying to get an answer now? I'm dying to get an answer because okay. I want to understand this book. <laughs> okay. All right. Once, all right. Yeah, yeah. Sherry said, you once said that it is believed that the consciousness is reborn and not a soul. And in general, that with the rebirth is conclusive to me. Where does this consciousness come from? Or how does this consciousness, which is reborn, come into our very first incarnation? And how does it continue to incarnate, which is, you mean reborn? Okay. Every time we use the word incarnate, it implies a soul. Okay. And furthermore, all right. And then the second question I will, I will read later as it involves directly about Valerie Hernandez. I was like, oh my God, what, who? <laughs> all right. So let me uh, answer the, the, the first one. And these are all valid, good questions. You have the right to ask. You have the right to be curious. So we don't know when the first reborn started. It all starts with causes and conditions. It is no different than, well, how did the earth get started, right? The, like, how are we here? How did the earth got started? How did living beings got started on earth? Well, one could say the existence of water and whatever is going on with that water millions and billions of years ago, right? If we look back into the tectonic plates and we look back at the study of the earth and geography and history and anthropology. So when it comes to how, how does this rebirth thing got started in the very first place? Um, what, what is the, the definition the, the, the term here I'm trying to use? Well, there is another word that is the same thing as infinite, right? Infinite, infinite time. So it's something that we, that we Buddhism cannot pinpoint exactly which AD or which BC, uh, of how the very first human got rebirth. <clears throat> the only proof we have is the Buddha himself and how he took, again, infinite level rebirths. He took infinite level rebirths and that is how he got to be so wise, right? 2,565 years ago when he became the Buddha, it part of his wisdom was being reborn so many times into different things. The Buddha was leaf, the Buddha was a tree. The Buddha was a lizard. The Buddha was a snake. He was a human. He was even female at certain points of his rebirths. So he had been through it all pretty much. Um, and so it's hard to trace just because, again, it is it is dependent. The answer here is because it is dependent on causes and conditions, right? Through every generation, through every humans and ever existed, homo sapiens, Homo erectus that has ever walked on the face of this planet. So it it it, it depends on multiple uh, causalities, factors, causes. Uh, again, this is a study that I mean, if you really wanted to dedicate to this academic study, it would take you probably a couple years down the road. Uh, okay, so now we go to the consciousness. Where does this consciousness come from, and how does this consciousness is reborn into the blah 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 blah? So, this is the analogy that many venerables have given about one candle being extinguished, right? And as it, as it is lit by another candle. So, when one candle is on its way out, it also lights another candle. Kind of keeps the candles, the rows of candles going. Consciousness is just that. And my teacher have told me, Venerable Dukmin, who is also spying on us right now, <laughs> somewhere in Texas, <laughs> uh, is that whatever knowledge you acquire in this lifetime also travels with you in the next lifetime. 
So when it comes to consciousness and it traveling with us or how consciousness is reborn is of no concern to me directly. Why? Well, because I'm not dead yet, so I wouldn't know. So I take it as, okay, well, that's great. There is a whole long list that we humans have to do in regards to living the good life. And so my, my opposing question for all of you is, okay, so even if you did get your answer about consciousness and rebirth, how does that change the present moment of how, you, how you're living and how you relate that to Buddhism at hand? Right? There's a lot of things that we have not seen for ourselves yet. Um, likewise, when we talk about consciousness and, and, and see previously, just now, right, just now, I have told you all that your knowledge travels with you in the next lifetime. Now, when we look back at our, all of our famous people that have walked the earth before we did, such as, oh gosh, Einstein, Albert Einstein. Let's take him for an example and, and figure similar to him and many other academic and philosophers that have come before him. Just think about all of the full Confucianism, right? Um, just think about it. You guys just sit here and think about it, about how did they get to become so wise? And that was like a very long time ago, right? And in modern day, we're like, oh my God, why are people so dumb? <laughs> um. Well, one could postulate that they became so wise is because from their previous lives, previous consciousness, they studied their tail off. So they took God knows how many rebirths that they have taken that have led to where they have bloomed like a wildflower, a very smart wildflower. And likewise, when we study rebirth, we've also looked at you know, people in modern day and we're like, what is wrong with you? It's common sense. How do you not have common sense? And I, I would postulate that these type of humans was previously in the animal realm, in the animal rebirth realms. Um, as we can see, the certain animals are very ignorant. They don't know any better. Um, you know, they're pretty much programmed to eat, poop and sleep um, and hunt. So therefore, you know, when the causes and conditions were right for them, uh, and if they did not do any harm, if they kept the precept as much as possible as the human realm, I'm sorry, as the animal realm, then they became human. But then once they, once the sperm and egg and the causes and conditions of becoming human, they lacked that previous knowledge that they did not acquire. So therefore now in this human realm, they, Pretty much one could describe one who has no brain. I mean, we've seen that those type of people run around the earth, you know, and we're just like, wow, holy cow. So they just have a very hard time navigating and uh, they don't understand themselves. People don't understand them. It's a lot of pain and suffering. The best those things people can do, the best things that those people can do is to keep the precept also and not to uh, cause any direct harms to themselves or other people. Furthermore, go back here. So a lot of these things um, are very scientifically puzzling, right? But I would assert that everyone stay straight on the path as a lot of things have not yet transpired. And if you're really curious about rebirth, study a lot of animals, study in the suttas where the rebirth realms are mentioned, and slowly buy in through the observations of humans and animals, you will get really close to your answers in regards to rebirths. Of course, if I sat here and talked about rebirth, it would take up all of class's time tonight. Uh, and when it comes to consciousness, uh, rebirth and consciousness, 
I would also invite you to research other monks and what they say about it. But it will come up to the same analogy as the candle lighting another candle once it is extinguished. Um, and so, you know, some of these things you just, the easiest attitude to approach is, is like, oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll find out when I'm ready to depart this world. Right. And then this also touches, you know, one thing will lead to another curiosity about the study of Arahants. And these, you know, these Arahants are fully enlightened beings in Thailand. You know, numerous, numerous, numerous icons that have attained supreme enlightenment as a result of wisdom that they have gained in this lifetime and previous lifetimes. So you tie all these in together and you will get a comprehensive answer for yourself. But for me, I like to keep it short, concise, to the point. And my job is to also redirect you back to transcending your suffering at hand and not to wander off too far about these questions because it's irrelevant to what we're doing here. And if you ponder too long about them, then you would be delaying your time studying what needs to be studied, practice what needs to be practiced, and know what needs to be known. Is, is, is that satisfactory for you, Miss Sherry? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. You have 30 days to appeal. <laughs> All right, let's talk about chapter 13. Does this relate to anybody who's got sleeping issues? Please unmute, let me know. Inspire your class. Me, I got sleeping issues. Hmm. Who else got sleeping issues? Hmm. Are you drinking boba? What did you just call me? Are you drinking boba? I am not a boba. Are you drinking boba? I'm not calling you a boba. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It is boba. I'm so jealous. You can't drink boba without me. <laughs> um. Yeah. I. I don't know. I think I might have sleep apnea because, like, a while ago, I used to wake up and like I couldn't breathe. Um. Lately, I don't think it happens. Um. I used to wake up to panic attacks, and if you've never experienced that. Probably the worst thing next to sleep paralysis. You've also never experienced sleep paralysis. I don't wish it upon anybody. Like it's, it basically, you feel when you wake up, you feel like you can't move your body. It's probably one of the scariest things I've ever experienced, but um, I don't wake up in panics uh, much anymore. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Hmm. Anyone else have sleeping issues? I cannot sleep mm. in. And I, yeah, I, it takes a long time. <laughs> mm. Anyone find this chapter helpful, useful? I did, I found it useful. So, <clears throat> I've struggled for this for years and years and years. Sometimes I still do because of my habits. And it is exactly that. Habits is what we have to look at. <clears throat> now, you know, millions of years ago, we didn't have LED lights. We didn't have halogen bulbs. We didn't have street lights. So, hunt, gathered, and reproduced. And uh, when the sun went down, that's it, night, night time. And now with the existence of, of urbaniz urbanization, uh, cities and concrete and everything else, um, now we are, oh, shoot, dang it. Hold on, hold on. Let, 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 I, I forgot the second part of the question for... Dang it, for Sherry. Hold on. 
And furthermore, Val writes, all of dear Buddha and dear Lord, and I wonder who this Lord or God is. I thought Buddhists do not believe in a God. Who is this God? Valerie, who is this God that you're referring to in your, your journal? Um, well, I come from a Christian Baptist background. Um, when I say God, I talk about the God that Thought Not Han recognizes. Um, when he, when Thought Not Han speaks on the kingdom of God, um, and how I recognize that is the earth, flowers, sky. Um, I don't necessarily, I don't call myself a Christian because I believe that uh, what Christians follow, at least today in, um, well, modern day Christianity and churches, I, I don't believe in. I don't believe that they're following the Bible. Um, I do reference scripture um, when needed, but um, I don't know how I see it is God, uh, is Buddha never claimed to be a God? Um, but I don't necessarily, it's kind of how I see, uh, I haven't read it yet, is living Buddha, living Christ is how Thought Not Han studied uh, Jesus Christ, and he also studied Buddha. Um, and I do believe there are correlations in regards to compassion. There's a lot of differences about these two religions, um, but that's what I'm referencing, um, is that video that is called, I think, What is God? Um when he's at a summit, I, I, I'm sure it's in France at Plum Village, and he's being asked, what is God um, at this summit? I think it was like a little kid that asked him, um, and he says that God is all around us. God is, you see him in flowers. And so I think that's how I recognize God. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. I'll take over from here. But it's not necessarily like, I don't agree with everything in the Bible, and I, I'm not going to uh, represent myself as a Christian. I just won't do that. I don't know. And that's per my own personal experiences. I don't know. You look like a Christian to me. I still them. What? I don't know. You look like a Christian to me. <laughs> <laughs> Venerable's got jokes tonight. Okay. All right. So when it comes to God, right? The question is, who really cares? Really? <laughs> Historically, it is have said to be that, you know, there's a BBC documentary that said that we have proof and evidence that Jesus once studied under the Buddha and he was a monk named Isa. Um... God knows how many BCs that they, they cited, but there was a time where they didn't know where Jesus was or what, what, what was he doing. Um, and anyways, so again, I think Jesus is awesome because I used to be Catholic and I also think Buddha is awesome. And I also think that Krishna and Vishnu uh, is awesome. They're pretty much all these awesome gods. Somewhere down the line, millions of years ago, when man created religion and and it, a sense of God, was because they were they were very much fearful, so especially the weather. You know, when thunders came and hurricanes came and tornadoes, they were like, "What in the blazing dukes is happening here?" So then they started worshiping the sun and then the moon and everything else. And they started worshiping animals and they still do until this very day. There's a lot of religions that, that worship the sun, the moon, the star, the skies, the planet. The, they even worship rats and elephants and cows. <clears throat> One must ask, what, 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 like, why does it matter if a god does or does not exist? Like, who cares? Right. The school of Jidao says they don't really care if a God exists. Why? Well, because we have suffering in front of us. And even if a God does exist, well, how would he want you to behave right now? <laughs> is keeping 
One must ask, is keeping the five precept, eight precept, or ten precept acceptable to all gods? I would assert so. I would bet my own enlightenment on it. Every god that ever existed will say, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know what? The precepts are pretty accurate and actually concurs with across a lot of religion. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't kill, don't steal. Honor thy father, thy mother, right? Forgive, right? If you all ever look at the commonalities across religions, you all realize, oh, they pretty much say the same thing. Mm. So this previous Christmas, when I uh, talk, I don't know, I gave a talk and I did not realize somebody was watching and it caught them. I mean, so many followers come back and they're like, you know, I followed you based on that one video that you you, you made. That one sixty second made a whole world of a difference to that person. And pretty much I stood in, in front of the nativity um, area. And I said, listen, folks, listen, give the gift of safety, which is the precepts. And you know what? One day you, we all have to answer to a God, whoever that God is. Matter of fact, why don't you pretend like there's a whole panel of them chilling with each other? They're probably chilling, smoke, smoking their vapes, looking at us. Okay. And you, 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 you got, you got Vishnu, you got Krishna, you got Jesus Christ, you got Gautama Buddha, you got other Buddhas standing next to the Buddha, you got Arahants chilling, you know, in the jury panel. So they're all just kind of standing there looking at you. And then what are you going to say? How are you going to justify that murder that you committed? How are you going to justify that manslaughter? How are you going to justify that theft? All right? How are you going to justify stealing and lying and cheating and sexual misconduct and raping and all these things that is immoral? All right? So that is a more relevant that is a more realistic sense of believing is that they're all great. They all exist. And if you have to stand in front of them, how would you justify yourself? And at the moment of death, how do you let go? So if you live a, the good life, which is a life that is ethical and moral, you fear not whoever that Lord is. It could be Lord Karma. Oh, yeah, karma, too. Karma's going to be chilling on a swing, swinging back and forth, listening to all this while everyone is smoking a vape, standing there judging you. So, um, you know, if you if, if, if you don't keep the precept, yeah. Oh, yeah, you're in it, buddy. Be a straight slide to hell. <laughs> slide. You get to slide right down to hell. You get a VIP pass and just slide right down. You don't even have to explain yourself. So the school of Chidao assert that you do the most good. You be generous. You be nice. You do everything that Buddhism teaches you. And you fear not at the moment of death, just like these Arahants. A very fearless life. Um, a victorious life. So, again, we can take the whole class time talking about God. But... In order to keep it short, concise, and useful for everyone that is involved, uh, that would be my response to you. And again, you can you can you get a doctorate in divinity and study God, uh, whoever God is. I mean, you can get a doctorate in Buddhism. You can get multiple doctorates in Buddhism. You can get multiple doctorates studying Hinduism. So again, if this is something that strikes you and you want to make it your lifelong journey, then approach it from an academic, scientific standpoint. Okay. All I right. wanted to say, Venerable too, um, that Sherry, it's it's a it's respecting um, my grandparents' um, faith as well. Uh, my mm -hmm. grandfather was a Baptist pastor in Phoenix for probably about twenty something years. Um, and then my grandmother is still ministering to people, and she's still going to my grandfather's um, church. So I think for me, although I agree uh, with with modern day Christians, more so probably conservatives, um, I, I still show respect and honor 
uh, to their faith and um, to what they do or what she's continued to do now that my uh, grandfather has been passed away for about 16 years. Um, to me, I see Buddha nature within her. Um, and, you know, not everybody's grown up in a, a loving Christian home. Um, but I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, and they definitely support me, uh, especially working with the venerable, which is, is really cool. Um, I feel like that is essentially like a, a blessing upon me. So great. Yeah. One, wonderful. How, you know, no matter if they're Buddhist or Muslim or Christian, you know, a true Muslim Buddhist or question or Christian would follow the commandments and the precept and the laws and the moralities to the letter of the teeth. We have seen many Buddhists. We have seen many Christians. We have seen many people who just don't live in alignment with the philosophy. <laughs> so the best way to honor them is, yeah. is to, you know, recognize, you know, uh, what is in alignment with their practice and what is in alignment with the words of God and what is in alignment with the words and teachings of the Buddha and so on. So again, you know, just uh, be good and everybody gets to go to heaven. It's my take on it. So now we go back to our academic study of CBT. Is uh, Okay, so number one, recognize that if you do have sleeping problem, take it extremely dead. Take it very dead, dead, extremely seriously because uh, lack of sleep is horrific for your health. health. Concentration, mood, and chronic lack of sleep is not, it's not pretty. Let me Google lack of crap consequences of lack of sleep mm. some of the most serious potential problems associated with chronic sleep deprivation are high blood pressure diabetes heart attack heart failure or stroke <laughs> other potential problem include obesity depression reduced immune system function and lower sex drive well, there you have it folks 11 effects of deprivation on your body uh, memory issues, trouble thinking and concentrating, accidents, being drowsy during the day can increase your risk of car accidents and injuries or other causes, mood changes, weakened Im Im immunity, high blood pressure, weight gain, diabetes, low sex drive, heart disease, poor balance. Lack of sleep can affect your balance and coordination, making you more prone to falls and other physical accidents. So if you were to Google the same, which I just did, these these are things that you know if you care about your your health you would take it very seriously so this book really doesn't do it a lot of justice again this book is trying to be concise to the point of what you need to know however i have bought a book not too long ago and i couldn't find it in this room because i realized i have to prioritize my book writing process but there was another book science of sleep so i invite everyone to look up the science of sleep on youtube and other academic studies of it if you are suffering from sleep deprivation. Um, <clears throat> difficulty getting off to sleep, tossing and turning, not being able to shut off your thoughts or findings, or finding it hard to get comfortable, frequent waking after you're asleep, early waking, non-restorative sleep. And by the way, if you're peeing a lot at night, you're waking up to pee a lot, that could be signs and symptoms of diabetes. So again, in Buddhism, when we meditate, we are very in tune with our body, all right? Our religious practice is mind and body, and we're very in tune to it, meaning, you know, it's like playing any sort of instrument. And so you, when there's something wrong with your body, when it comes to peeing and pooping and sleeping, again, pay very close attention to what your body's telling you, because it could be in trouble and catch it while you in the early stages and not let it get too far to the point where you need specialists and then you need robotic surgeries. Uh, on page 202 of third edition, eliminating unhelpful sleep expectation. This is where we look at the attitudes of people who have sleep problems and then they really beat themselves up because they have sleep problems. Again, 
think intelligently, right? And think wisely in regards to assessing your sleep situation is, you know, especially people who love lights. Yeah. Or people who are afraid of the dark, right? Leave lights on. And that alone could be frustrating for your body to just trying to fall asleep because certain blue lights trick your mind into believing that it is actually daytime. But then you're trying to will yourself to sleep. And so, but your body's like, how about not? Okay. During the day while you try, you may have thoughts like, I'll never be able to get to sleep. I'm not in for another night of waking up every two hours. Understandably, you may have these expectations if your sleep has been disturbed for some time. But such thinking is likely to perpetuate your sleep disturbance. Be aware of your worrying thoughts about sleep problems, such as I'll be able to cope on such little sleep. I've got to get some sleep tonight. Okay. So, again, um, just looking at the the attitude that we have. A lot of people try to force themselves to sleep, and it is rarely successful. In doing so, contradicts the principle of allowing yourself to rest and relax because you're making an effort to sleep protracted problem sleeping can cause you to make negative association with going to bed. You may be fully expecting to be awake all night and to have a fitful sleep with anxiety dreams. You may find yourself putting off bedtime for fear of what thoughts and feelings await you. You probably have a nasty case of bed dread. Getting into a clean sleep routine, uh, sleep hygiene is about establishing healthy bedtime routines and behaviors. Leading health organization in Europe and North America recognize the guidelines we offer in this section. What you do, eat, and drink during the day impact on how well you sleep at night. So if we're eating junk food, folks, probably not going to serve you well. You may not need to be as strict with your routine. After your sleep has returned to normal, as you do when you're still getting back on track, although anyone can benefit from sticking to a clean routine. Tiring yourself out, it talks about exercising. And you all know that, I mean, there is insurmountable amount of evidence and benefits when it comes to exercising. Okay, Establishing a sleep window. Start with a six-hour sleep window. Continue. Following the schedule for two weeks, we got an open mic. Someone's got an open mic here. Val, you got an open mic. Oh, okay, sorry. Over the following week to 10 days, bring your bed bedtime forward by 30 minutes every couple of days until you're sleeping seven to eight hours each night. And though the book says, you know, six to nine hours, it varies per individual. I like everyone here to meet. The one and only person that needs 10 hours of sleep, which is me. <laughs> For some odd reason, 10 hours just does it. It makes me very productive. Less than that, not sure. And previous research have also shown the more intelligent you are, the later you actually sleep and attempt to stay up at night pondering about things, which is a habit of mine. And, you know, as an urgent care monk, when people tell me about their problems, I also think about it. And I also take it to bed because I'm trying to come up with a solution to their problems, but specifically tailored to them. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. Mixing napping. And when it comes to napping, I have some... So cat napping may be very tempting, but ultimately interferes with your bedtime and can actually lower your mood. Yeah, it's napping is kind of weird. You're going to have to experiment with it. In my country, Vietnam, we take a nap from 12 to 1, sometimes 12 to 2. The whole country shuts down from 12 to 2, oh, sometimes uh, one thirty. But the average is kind of like from, from 12 to 2. The whole country takes a nap, period. Like nobody wanders the streets. They just run home and they take a nap. Or they close their shop and they take a nap in the shop. Um. And, you know, it, it's very rejuvenating, re-energizing. We've got a lot of research that says napping is a good thing and companies should allow their, their workers to nap. However, napping more than 
an hour or so could affect your circadian rhythm uh, later at night. But napping is something that I encourage everyone. Um, slowing down on stimulation, avoiding caffeinated drinks from mid to afternoon. Caffeine can stay in your system for a long time. We're not just talking about tea and coffee. Many soft drinks, chocolate, and various energy drinks contain caffeine. Even some herbal teas contain stimulants, such as mat and guarana. Uh, as, so, so check labels. As for school, your best bet is to avoid altogether until your sleep is sorted out. Alcohol has an initial sedation effect, but it soon rebound and can lead to early waking. You should also avoid stimulating activity while in bed, including eating and reading gripping page turners, turners, which is like like scary novels, stuff that you know your brain is trying to look forward to what, what's going to happen next. Detective fictions also do that. The idea is to help your fatigued mind build healthful sleep, inducing association with your boudoir. So restrict your device use to listening to soothing music, tranquilizing podcasts, and avoid watching programs or working, gaming, and so on. The only activity you should really be doing in bed are sleeping and getting ready to sleep, and of course, sex. Okay, so yeah, we got a big problem with carrying our phones in our bed because it's com comfortable sometimes we have jobs that require us to have the phone in the bed if we are first responders and you guys just be aware of what we're doing right when we're associating with bed and office office and bed and then you mix the two together and you're going to have all sorts of weird sleep cycles all sorts of infrequent disruptive quality of sleep right we look at um advertisement of Tempur-Pedic beds or sleep number beds and we realize wow this bed is really really awesome I, you know but it's it's the way how you lead your life into the bed and living your life at home in the bed that ultimately affects the quality of your bed your bed bedtime sleeping time now mind you monks don't have sleeping beds sleeping number beds Tempur-Pedic level luxuries Monks sleep on the floor. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's very uncomfortable. We get used to it. It straightens out our back and it cures laziness. And you wake up six in the morning, you realize, oh, wow, Whew, that floor. And then up you go. That's it. You have to have that breakthrough. Comfort is an enemy when it comes to the spiritual practice. So one must up, out, just do it. Page 207 talks about relaxing your muscles. Anyone have any questions so far before we continue about what I've read? No questions? No questions on my side. Mm -hmm. 207 talks about relaxing your muscles. Talks about focusing on certain parts of your body, your calves, your knees, and moving up like a body scan, tightening your muscles, relaxing them. Step-by-step -step guide. You can find this online on Google. Mm. Muscle tensions. Yeah, we have a lot of stress in America. Well, around the world too. Japan, Europe. People work a lot. They're very tense. Meditation aims to reduce that as much as possible, but when you have a lot of muscle aches, your body's telling you you're overworking, you're really stressed out, you need to take a break. The body has a very unique way of telling you things, and so, you know, take it seriously. Take your health very seriously, the quality of your life. And for those who work a lot and their sleep is being dis disruptive or if the quality of your life is being disruptive, you got to think that you're working so hard for X amount of money, but your body is suffering. So therefore, all the money that you have saved up will subsequently go to medical bills. Um, will go to medical bills. And so what was the point? <laughs> you, 
you guys ever wonder about that? You know, like what's the point? So, you know, we want to find the middle way here in Buddhism, which is just right. Sometimes people really get their sights on the income aspect of their jobs. And uh, they're like, no, gotta, gotta make X amount of money out of worries, out of fear. Okay, moving on to uh, limiting the blue light, which I've addressed that earlier. Making your bedroom so cozy. Take care to make your bedroom relaxing, soothing place to be. Get yourself a nice, nice clean bed linen, low light options. Remove clutter from the room. Hang some relaxing pictures on the wall and make the temperature right for you. Uh, if your bed is uh, really, really, really old, um, yeah. Smells can carry strong associations, so consider putting some candles using pleasant fabric softeners. All right, so obviously we got a, a bunch of stuff out there that help make you guys fall asleep a lot faster and stay asleep longer. Um, again, the bed just needs to be used as a bed. Don't, don't. don't. <laughs> it's convenient when we have... Our bedroom is a very convenient place for a lot of things, actually. Hanging out. Sometimes people use their bedroom as a living room. <laughs> and, uh, you know, your your subconscious mind it associates all sorts of things. And when it looks at the bed, it looks like, oh, look, it's a party place. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. So just move some things around. The last part of this section of the book talks about, I mentioned about medication. And if your sleep is adversely being affected and it rises to the level of clinical attention, then yes, please consult your primary care physician, and they will probably let you see sleep doctors. Are they pulmonology? No, they're not pulmonology. I'm not sure what the specialty is for sleep doctors, but they will order a sleep, sleep, sleep study. A sleep study. Uh, your physician could also give you antihistamine, they can give you hypnotics, uh, they can give you SSRIs, uh, and or antipsychotic, low dose of antipsychotic. So they will scan you for any organic causes. And from a medical standpoint, they will deem what is most appropriate for you with the right dosage. Again, we want to try to solve this um, as organically as possible without reliant or dependent on Western medicine and uh, because my dad is a doctor of oriental medicine I also encourage you all to try out Eastern uh, herbs and and you know consult an, an, a DOM or an OMD which is a doctor of oriental medicine and see what their take is on it and they could probably give you something that is less dependent less potent uh, but however it could have equal effects to Western medicine so I don't object you guys to branch out with some curiosity out in the world in order to, you know, get this thing down and solve this problem, solve this sleep problem. I've, I've met people actually that have had sleep problems for like 10 years and I'm like, how are you alive? <laughs> you know, and if only we can actually see through their bodies and into their bodies. That's horrible. That's ho horrific. Um, okay, so we're wrapping up chapter 13 in, in regards to the science of sleep. Anyone have any comments, remarks, suggestions, questions in regards to the science of sleep? So I really encourage you all to look even deeper on this is surface level understanding of sleep science. But, you know, I'm very concerned myself. When it, when it comes to the study of neurology, brain health, and the, and the brain memory, and you know longevity, um, you know I like to function as efficient and as effective as possible from now until the remaining balance of my natural living life. And so, you know, we have now than ever before, we have all sorts of empirical data, suggestions, recommendations from all boards of medicine that will help us do that. And matter of fact, Barnes & Noble have a lot of books on longevity. 
<laughs> where they summarize everything, longevity and resiliency that help us, you know, really tame, try to tame life as much as possible. Right? The warrior in life, because, you know, life can beat you down with work, occupation, friends, family, social life, uh, you know, uh, drugs, booze, alcohol. So I invite you all to, you know, take this section as a reminder about taking care of your health and not just sleep. So we will now move on to chapter 14 in the third edition when it comes to overcoming obsessions. Um, particularly as we focus on OCD. So anyone have any OCD issues? Have them or know someone who's had them? Have observed somebody? Have ever been told by a therapist? Um, suspect that you or your loved ones have had OCD? You guys can share it now. I have OCD. Would you like to tell us? Sometimes it's like, it's like a struggle, but sometimes like, like just, my thoughts would just be all over the place. And so, sometimes like, it's bigger than others, but um, also using um, my, my therapist to find, I guess, solutions to these thoughts in my head. Um, for example, um, I kind of struggle with, you know, well, I struggle with like, I guess, um, certain, like certain, what do you call, things that like a touch freaks me out like really bad. Or sometimes I just think like, like, oh, everybody like hates you and blah, blah, blah. Or I'm just like, think like, oh crap. Man, hopefully that door is, like, I keep thinking is the door's locked, but like, is the house okay? Like, hopefully somebody has to come in at night. I'm like, I'm just sitting there freaking out. Mm. So, yeah, that's how, uh, yeah, that's how busy kind of, like, really affects me. Mm. We also have some new people joining us. And anyone that's new here, would you like to introduce yourself? You don't have to, but just so that you feel a part of the group that we have going on. Hi, all. My name's Chris, and I was here last week. I've just been kind of observing and kind of starting to participate recently. Ah, very good. And um, Carolyn, would you like to introduce yourself? And also Min. Is this the same Min on uh, Instagram? Or is this a different Min? Okay. So, uh, moving on to OCD. This is a very serious issue. I was able to glance over um, a few things on... Med Circle, Med Circle have a very unique way, special way of conveying information for members of the public to fully understand what's going on with all sorts of mental illness as described in the DSM-5. And <clears throat> so when we talk about OCD, a lot of people suffer from this. Um, if you don't suffer from this, you know, it's good to have this in your mind because you may develop this down the road. Or people in your family or friends could have these type of symptoms and it may rise to the level of clinical concern that they may not be aware of. So we Buddhists, you know, we, we're smart, intelligent, full of wisdom and aware of the existence of such mental suffering. And, you know, we sometimes we, we want to convey or let them know, hey, I think... I think you should get this thing checked out. It's not normal to check your car door 50 times a day, you know, unless they live in a 
crime ridden area where, you know, like New Jersey, where it's like the capital of auto thefts. And, you know, it is well established, evidence based that such worry does warrant the consideration of checking your car doors and looking out the window and make sure your car is still there <laughs> every hour. <laughs> so, <clears throat> let me see here. OCD is now ranked among the most common psychiatric disorder. This change is probably due to increased awareness amongst health professionals and more accurate assessment measures. CBT is well recognized as the psychological treatment of choice for obsessional problem and has far superior relapse rates compared to medication alone. Oh, I love CBT. Other OCD-related disorders include body dysmorphic disorder, which involves very preoccupied and dissatisfied with one or more aspect of your physical appearance. Uh, illness anxiety disorder is a preoccupation with the chance of either having or getting a serious life-limiting illness. Now, you guys imagine the coronavirus issue, the existence of virus, the study of virology and bacteria. You all can imagine the world going into OCD mode when it comes to sneezing and touching things. And then we got all these gadgets out there. Like you got this key that helps you, you know, touch the like ATM machine. And then we have all sorts of things that we can use to open the door. And rightfully so, you know, people are very aware of what they're touching because they don't want to get Corona on them. <clears throat> Our world is, um, as we move into OCD, which is, I would describe it as the the problem of uncertainty. And it is indeed. In, in this world, there's a lot of uncertainties. Uncertainties when it comes to disease, uh, old age, decay. We are, as humans, we are subject to all of these things. Now, if you ever have a pet, they're also subject to a lot of things. If you have a pet where well, your pet is subject to gum disease, your pet is subject to kidney disease, your pet is also subject to cancer. Matter of fact, if you have a fish, your fish can have brain cancer. Did you guys know fish can get brain cancer? I actually witnessed one online that was getting surgery on its brain. Hold on, let me see here. Okay, well, can't can't pull it up yet. But anyways, so you know, we humans, you know, part of being human is the uncertainty of of things. And you know, the word therapy, all it is is information. And people are, are afraid and uncertain. Because there's a lack of sufficient information to let them know that, yeah, it's it's okay. It's all right. You know, these reinforcing behaviors is not really going to change a lot of things. And it is, this is the true nature of reality of life. This is the true nature of reality of being human. Um, so we move into definition-related uh the terms related to obsessions uh, as defined in page 212. An obsession is a persistent unwanted thought, image or doubt or urge that intrudes into our mind, into your mind and triggers distress obsession or said to have reached a psychiatric problem level when they cause significant levels of distress, interfere with your life and present more than an hour a day. Preoccupation means absorbed with something troubling that won't leave your mind. You feel compelled to give it your attention. Preoccupations are fueled by self that reaches proportion outside of typical everyday human experience. They're similar to obsession in that they're regarded as problematic when they cause significant distress, 
interfere with your life and last for more than an hour per day. In this chapter, we focus a preoccupation common to OCD, like the prevalence of germs or poison or content of unwanted or intrusive thoughts, such as, do I want to harm my loved one? Uh, did I turn off the cooker? And other related uh, body, dys body dysmorphic disorder and illness anxiety disorder. We, def we define compulsion, also called rituals, are the actions you may take in response to your obsession or preoccupation that do not particularly help you in your life. Compulsions can be observable behaviors such as checking your checking or washing your hands and can be carried out in your mind such as repeating a phrase in your head or counting. Compulsions are usually attempts to get rid of a thought, image, urge, or doubt, an attempt to reduce danger or an attempt to reduce discomfort. They may provide some immediate relief, but doesn't last. You may have to repeat the rituals over and over. Then lastly, we have avoidant behaviors. Are things you do to avoid triggering your obsession and preoccupation? Your avoidance behavior may be avoiding driving in areas of heavy pedestrian traffic, avoiding holding sharp objects when around other people, or avoiding discarding empty cleaning products for fear of inadvertently poisoning someone. Understanding uh, OCD, the APA define OCD as a problem in which the sufferer is plagued by either obsession or compulsion, or is usually both. They experience unwanted recurring intrusive thoughts, impulses, or images that cause marked distress and are not simply excessive worries about real life problems. The sufferer makes attempt to ignore, suppress, or neutral neutralize the obsessions and recognizes them as the products of their own mind. Common obsession in OCD includes fear of contamination to yourself or others via germs, bodily fluid, or toxins, fear of accidentally deliberately causing harm to yourself or others, example, jumping off a bridge or poking a needle into someone's eye, or acting impulsively and becoming uncontrollably violent or aggressive, dire need for order, symmetry, or strict routine, including the need to carry out activities in a particular sequence, Religious obsessions such as fear of offending God, committing a mortal sin, or inadvertently acting in allegiance with the devil. Sexual obsessions such as fear of being a pedophile, or doubt as to whether you've viewed illegal pornography, or behave in a sexually inappropriate manner. Ritual driven by superstition to prevent harming, harm coming to yourself or others, like deciding only even numbers are safe, or having to recite a specific praise before bed to protect your family until morning, fear of losing something important such as possession, paperwork, or ideas, uh, or your autobi autobiographical memory, memory of personal events, fear of behaving irresponsibly and causing a fire, flood, or other types of accidents, fear of acting out intrusive thought, image in a way that violates your moral code, Need to do an action until it feels right, like locking your door until it feels properly locked. Kissing your children goodnight until it feels like you've given them your love or taking a shower until you feel clean. Uh, compulsions frequently associated with OCD includes checking uh, if light switch is off or the front door is locked, cleaning or washing such as yourself, others, your home, car possessions, um, that you take outside, counting, ordering, and doing things in a sequence, repeating actions or special words, images, or numbers in your mind to stave off vaguely defined danger, organizing and making things just so, having difficulty discarding possessions that have no real value, interest, or function, but you may have had sentimental worth, making excessive numbers of lists before actually taking any action or doing too much research before making a decision. Replaying or repeating scenes, image, or actions in your mind. Okay. So I have to read this the way that it, that it is here. It's because OCD is a, is a serious issue. And there are OCD expert therapists out there. Uh, psychologists and psychiatrists that help people do this. And of course, whoever's watching across all of the platforms are also screening themselves and trying to make sense whether they are suffering from such... Um, 
behaviors and manifestations of OCD. You can think of OCD as a stress response. We sometimes refer to it as a mental uh, eczema because it stands to flare up when you're at a low ebb due to stress, illness, fatigue, or hormonal changes, or even in response to positive changes like moving into a new house or embarking on a new adventurous holiday. Uh, many people may recognize some degree of the excessive worries and rituals outlined here. What determines whether you meet the criteria for diagnosis of OCD is how much how much choice you feel you have to stop a ritual without debilitating distress and how much interference OCD is causing in your daily life. We have any questions so far? Any confusions? Page 215, things we do to reduce their distress in short term often maintain problems in the long run, so the solution becomes the problem. In the case of OCD, behaviors such as avoidance, checking, washing, seeking reassurance, comparing, readjusting, and repeating are the maintaining mechanism. Most clients we work with their problem agree intellectually that their behavior perpetuate and aggravate their problems but very often they can now see clearly what you mean after the experiment with them in chapter four it talks about designing cbt experiments to challenge your thinking the first step is to understand the concept of problem maintenance the next step is to experience how your behavior affect your obsession and preoccupation by doing experiments you can kind of you can Try two, two kinds of experiment with your obsessional thinking. Reduce or stop a particular ritual and see how this affects the frequency, intensity, and duration of your upsetting thoughts. Increase a ritual or avoidance for a day and see what effect this has on the frequency, intensity, and duration of your upsetting thoughts. Increasing a ritual avoidance is often easier to do in short term and often yields more results more rapidly. Um, in Buddhism, we train you all to see the true nature of reality of anything, 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 anything. When it comes to germs, the true nature of reality of germs, the true nature of reality of viruses, the true nature of reality of crime, the true nature of reality of the statistics of crime, right? With those who understand karma and crime, the connection and correlation between the two. Um, we, teaches, we teach you guys how to let these thoughts come, and as fast as it comes, as fast as they will diminish. OCD is when these thoughts come, and then you arrest the thought, and then you act on that thought, right? And it becomes a habit, and it becomes a ritual become a ever persistent thing that wastes your time and how you challenge them is ask yourself well the things that i'm doing here how is this gonna help what my faulty thinking that led me to believe that i need to do this in order to keep myself safe hmm. so you know all of my students who are present i like you guys to be mindful of this ocd thing as we move into buddhism and teaching you all to be mindful of your thoughts, stay clear uh, and objective when it comes to the river of thoughts that will come. The thoughts, the doubts, the uncertainties, right? These river of thoughts when they come, how, how do we look at them clearly as they are? And caution ourselves not to act on them and question whether or not if acting on them would in fact fix anything. Could or could not fix anything. Okay. We have any questions so far? Research and okay, now we're at 216 acquiring anti obsessional attitudes. 
Research and clinical observation shows that a number of thinking styles are related to the development of obsessional problems. Okay. You can also use thinking to combat obsessional problems. Following section offer alternative ways of thinking that can help you in your fight against obsessional problems. Tolerating doubt and uncertainty. In our and many other therapists' experience, one of the main protestations that clients make about stopping ritual avoidant behavior is along the line of, how can you guarantee that what I'm afraid of won't happen? The truth is, of course, that we can't. But no one without obsessional problems get those kinds of guarantee either. So, so clearly, the problem isn't a lack of certainty. We can have for a different kind of guarantee, however, as long as you continue to demand a guarantee or certainty that your fears won't come true, you're likely to keep your obsessional problem. Instead, practice consistently and repeatedly tolerating doubt and uncertainty without resorting to checking, washing, reassurance, seeking, or whatever you do compulsively. Your rituals only fuel your belief that you need certainty, initially staying with doubt may well feel uncomfortable but if you stick with your anxiety can reduce uh, uh, deliberately seek out triggers for your doubt and practice resisting the urge to carry out rituals seek reassurance and work things out in your mind so i want to share something with you guys uh, on my way back to the temple i uh, i was hanging out with my parents this afternoon and i'm teaching a lot they know that they've seen me and I'm just sitting there, I'm just like, I can't believe I turned out to be an educator. I, I, you know, my life goal was not to turn out to be as an educator. Our whole family, my family, all the way up to great, great grandpa, right? All of us are educators, actually. My dad, my uncles, my aunts, they all have master's degrees. They all teach. My dad is a professor. So now I'm like, how did I end up here? Then we talk, started talking about my grandfather, as this directly relates to doubt and uncertainty of what I just read. So that was like, well, we were talking about the amount of money that my, my grandpa did not make as an educator, as, as, as the God, the man was like quadruple discipline professor and was the advisor for the U.S. consulate back in the war times and so my dad said that my grandfather taught so much that he had holes in his lungs and of course he was also there was malnutrition because the family was poor and he also had was it his intestines cut out due to severe intestinal issues gastroenterol gastroenterology issues but then there's this other side of my grandpa, which like, I'm like, you hear it and you're like in disbelief that he was very optimistic man. <laughs> he was just, he was just this very optimistic man going about life. And basically the picture that was being painted was he just didn't care. He just didn't care. The art of not giving a crap. Literally, the art of not giving a crap. <laughs> the man just didn't care. He didn't care about a lot of things. He was uh, an undisputed caliber for his profession and an undisputed caliber human. That There was nobody that was of his caliber, both academically, experientially, but it was funny because he was just he was just like this very academically enlightened being. But my dad says, you know, when he rode the bicycle, th the bicycle didn't even have brakes. The bicycle didn't even have lights, nothing. It like it just moved. <laughs> so you have this very enlightening man just on this bicycle that just didn't care about safety. He it, it's just like, whatever. They were poor and they didn't have enough to eat. And my dad says, you know, your grandpa was like. Well, if there's nothing to eat, well, who cares? <laughs> if I die, I die. Who cares? He had a very carefree attitude. Right? And 
is, well, well, my dad's got it too. My dad's got it too. And if you all profile carefully, thoroughly and slowly, you all can see that I adopted similar attitudes, right? Just look at my teachings. Just, just, just look at the beginning of this, this talk up until now. One could say he really cares about humanity. He does. By and through his actions, he does. You see it. Undisputed. The world has ever seen, actually. Right? Matter of fact, I just got another 100,000 followers on TikTok. You don't get 100,000 more by not caring, folks. So it's undisputed, empirical evidence base that I care, truly do. But when you see, if you guys ever get to hang out with me in real life, you see how much stuff additionally that I don't really care. You know, it is what it is and it can't be what it's not. So hopefully you all adopt the attitude of exactly just that, which is exactly what Buddhism teaches. It is what it is and it can't be what it's not. And that is exactly what Vipassana meditation is, is training you to see things as they are. Seeing you to, to see the true nature of reality. Yeah, We're here for 80 years, if you're lucky, longevity. You know, and what's going to happen is going to happen. You can't. Some things you can't avoid, some things you can't. Some things karma is destined for you due to the causes and conditions. If you're going to get sick at 50, you're going to get sick at 30. If you're going to die at 30, you're going to die at 30. No matter what you're going to do. Now, I was a young man, and I don't think I, I grew up with not having OCD. Oh, God. Growing up, I was plagued by all sorts of rituals and rites and superstitions that came with being Vietnamese. And that meant, you know, there's these guys that they read your hand, right? And they're like fortune tellers and birth chart readers. And of course, they're like, oh, yeah, at a certain age, you should stay in the house. And then there's stories to back that up. And we hear a bunch of other stories about people dying on that day at that time because they did not heed the advice of these palm readers. Uh, and so in my life, I'm like, oh, great. Great. So what, what I'm supposed to live with, you know, this fear of a certain age, time and place that I may, you know, suffer greatly or die. Uh, so, so, you know, somewhere down the line, you know, when you, you get to my age and, so, and if you practice right, you will get to my spiritual age, which is probably 100 years old by now. You know, it's just like and if again, if you keep the precept and if you have the best interests of other people in mind. You don't care. You don't give a crap. You really don't. If karma takes you, go ahead. I don't care. Heck, I'll probably be in a, a an hour hunt. Yay. No more paying bills. You know, if you all approach life with an optimistic view of life, then you can look at some of these and you're just like, what is there worth worrying about? True, clearly. All of you are intelligent. Right, because I have never not have a not intelligent, unintelligent student, and you just have to ask yourself, uh, you know, in regards to living situations, you know, if you live in the South Side and you hear gunshots every night, yeah, all right, well, that's probably worth you know worrying about. Again, if you lived in like New Jersey and there's capital number one of car thefts, you know. If you live in the capital of murders, if you live in an area where there is sexual offenders, habitual violent sex offenders, you know, uh, sex predators, um, and you are a woman, it's probably wise to probably look at a new place to move and not stick around in a place where the causes and conditions are probably right, you know, you know the, just the science and the potential and probability of you getting raped is there the, its presence is there okay but you know if, if it would be ridiculous to have these thoughts intrusive thoughts if you live in a gated community and your neighbor is a cop or around the corner of a cop you know and or especially here in america it's quite safe 911's uh, no joke 911 gets there quite safe in my country it's 113 not 911 and when you hit 113, they arrived after everyone is dead. 
they they just take their sweet time because they want to arrive when everyone is dead. They don't want to save anybody. Okay, so just think about the OCD about people in Vietnam, right? Nobody exempts from OCD. So just imagine getting into a fight or getting robbed or something like that. By the time the police shows up, there's just body bags. That's it. You know, you ask the report of the people. You take a survey of the people in Vietnam about their trust and confidence in police officers there. Heck, police officers there, they wear sandals, folks. They ride bicycles and they wear sandals. No gun, no handcuffs. Right? So they just, and then you see some of these YouTube videos of them wrestling with people. And it's like a WWE wrestling match. And I'm just like, are you kidding? There's no power. There's no authority. There's no authority to arrest. Like, they're literally throwing sandals at each other. And I'm like, you will never find that here in the U.S. You will not find that in Australia. You will not find that in Europe. <laughs> what is happening here? So, um, again, I like to everyone to challenge yourselves about the validity of such un doubt and uncertainty in the world that we live in and using the best available science to narrow down what it is we know about germs, crimes, safety, you know. And once you take proper steps to safeguard your house, your car, it is what it is. It's what we have insurance. And the other thing is we have insurance. We have a lot of things that keep us from losing the stuff that we have. And the rest, you know, you just got to live an optimistic life. You live a very long life living an optimistic life like my grandfather, who despite having 11 holes in his lungs and half intestine, was a slap, he died very peacefully <laughs> and very happily and very optimistically at what, 80, like 90 years old in Australia. And as a direct result of dying so peacefully and optimistically, everyone else was at, was at peace in, in the paternal side of my family. Like, I, I, had, I did not see anyone cry. And I'm like, are you guys not sad? And they were like, no, he give, he lived a good life. And he left us instructions on how to live. Um, so it's very liberating. All right? The point of that is it is very liberating. And you should hang yourself. You should, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. I just said you should hang yourself. You should hang out with people um, who are optimistic. And you should uh, get more... Um, inspirational stories of people who are optimistic and study those people who live their life optimistically right versus pessimism right pessim oh god the first page in every medical book is number one the first page you turn right it will tell you be optimistic right because once you start turning the page in the medical books oh boy ain't nothing good all sorts of diseases Mind, body, eyes, nose, ears, breast, uh, cancer. Um, God, this is horrific. So, moving on to, let me see here. Anyone have any questions? Any confusions? Remarks, comments so far? I can't believe you just said that, Venerable. <laughs> said what? What did I say? When you're like, you should hang yourself. Yeah, I meant to say hang out. Y'all should hang out. I talk so fast, I don't even catch certain words. I'm like, what did I just say? I, I just told everyone to hang themselves. I was like, when you said that, I was like, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> So in America, we call that ADHD. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Mm. I'm going to go get some boba. <laughs> it looks so good. I love boba. The fact that I'm chewing the boba underneath constitutes eating, which constitutes breaking one of the precepts of cannot eat after 12. Mm, yeah. Is that because... So I was reading about that. Um, is it because... Of digesting at night, is that why? The Buddha don't want us fat. Simply put, fat oh, and lazy. Okay. Right. Well, was he historically was he really thin or was he like average weight? He was a handsome man, 
And uh, okay, he was he was actually one of the most beautiful figure the world has ever seen. If you read the was it, 32? 32 fine marks of a Buddha, and you will see. Mm. Well, it's kind of weird when it comes to like his fingers. He has webbed fingers, and I think web toes and so it's kind of like i don't know but the the, the huh. I don't, when i read it i was like i want some webbed fingers so i can swim better <laughs> <It's kinda> <laughs> <laughs> no but you know he was pretty awesome Funny. he was a warrior he was very well fit um he actually beat everybody mm. in competition um in regards to uh martial Anything that has to do with uh, battles and archery, um, he learned military mm. military arts. So he was not a fat military artist. I can tell you that. <laughs> mm. Mm. But the rules for monks. Oh, uh, oh! Additionally, let me also emphasize discipline too, as it as it comes to disciplining of the mind and body. So, we spoke about my grandpa. Now let's talk about grandma on the paternal side. And so, I mean, we're Catholic, originally Catholic. And grandma actually kept the eight precepts without even knowing that it was the eight precepts in Buddhism. She forbid everybody. She got like seven, seven kids. Seven kids. My grandma has seven kids. My dad has seven siblings. Seven or eight. And she imposed. And listen, when grandma imposed, it was laws in the home. She was no joke. She was, if she was alive today, oh my God, I, I don't know where I would be. I would probably just run away. But there was no entertainment, right? Strict studying, strict sleep time. And you're not allowed to talk that much in the house. And the pro and the the problem maker was actually my dad, who's always trying to just egg stuff on with his siblings and cause them to cry, moan, and complain. So my dad got the the worst of the end of the stick with grandma. But it was a very strict house. But you see the end result was that by imposing these precepts onto the kids, they actually grew up and made something of of themselves you know everyone became professors you know so and then it, it inspired me now i'm a teacher <laughs> you know <laughs> so so look at the eight precepts in buddhism i think it will serve you all well and be inspired by some of these stories just because in the west and elsewhere in the world people are lazy 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 so you know they don't they don't follow the precepts so later on don't blame Nobody else but yourself if you end up homeless and broke and and so on and so on, right? And if it, if it is traced back to your self-discipline and the cause of lack of self-discipline, well, you don't have to live with that one. <clears throat> okay, so now we move on real quick here. I just want to read some of these important aspects of OCD. Trusting your judgment in an attempt to explain why individuals with obsessional problems check so much more than those without these problems, scientists explore the hypothesis that people with OCD have poor memories. The rationale here was perhaps that people with OCD check or seek reassurance because they can't remember properly. Uh, the scientists did make an important discovery. People with obsessional problem have no memory deficit. What they do have, however, is poor confidence in their memory. Poor confidence in one's memory may be related to unrealistic demand for certainty because no amount of checking removes that grain of doubt from your recall. The best thing you can do to boost your confidence in memory is to act as if you are more confident and cut back on rituals. Doing so consistently and repeatedly gradually help you build your confidence. Well. Checking doors, huh? I don't know. One of those things where a lot of people do, and if you have OCD of checking doors, adopt methods of like writing it down. It's like a list. You write down a list. I don't know. To help people feel better and narrowing it down to a science of reassurance, 
maybe you should like write like a lock-in sheet whoever you know just like security officers right they um you know if they check something or, or even like bathrooms um you know we've been in public bathrooms where this got this uh sign-in sheet or a checklist or something like that some some kind of login where who was in there last you know like the employee who was in there last who checked the toilet paper who cleaned it who answered you know the complaints of a messy bathroom so a person with ocd would want to do that in regards to their um you know their door you know last time i checked it was at one o'clock two o'clock you know hopefully they can break the habits slowly desensitize from that and realize oh it's been a couple hours and nothing happened to the car no one came in so on and so on plus additionally we have technology that can help with reassurance too which is uh the arlo uh, security cameras and the door the ring the ring system company ring treating your thoughts as nothing more than thoughts right which is exactly what buddhism teaches you one of the main thinking error of obsessional problem is overestimating the importance of intrusive doubt, thoughts, and images that occur naturally in your mind. Uh, the probability of misinterpretation, the idea is that having a thought about an event in your mind affects the probability of that event occurring. For example, if I allow myself to picture myself hurting someone, then it's more likely that I'll do it. The moral interpretation, misinterpretation. <clears throat> The idea that an unpleasant thought entering your mind reveals something unpleasant about yourself. For example, having thoughts of causing harm means I'm a bad and dangerous person. The responsibility misinterpretation. The idea that having a thought about an event means that you have responsibility for it happening or for preventing it from happening. For example, having an image of myself jumping from a tall building means that I need to be more vigilant than the average person when confronting heights. Intrusive thoughts, images, doubts, and impulses are entirely normal. Your assumption that the thoughts that you're having aren't normal is the problem. Maybe I should repeat that, right? Intrusive thoughts, images, doubts, and impulses are entirely normal. Your assumption that the thoughts that you're having aren't normal is the problem. Uh... The solution is to allow these thoughts to pass through your mind without engaging with them or trying to change or suppress or hurrying them along. Try to picture your thoughts like the ripples in a pond of water after you throw in the stone. Eventually, the water becomes still again. Um, being flexible and not trying too hard. He gave us some using external and practical criteria here. Let's see. People with OCD tend to use internal criteria, such as something that feels right, better, or comfortable to make decision. Here are two examples of internal criteria with the external alternatives. A person with contamination OCD may wash his hands until he feels that his hands are clean enough. Someone with problem may tend to stop washing when he can see his clean hands are clean and when he's been through a quick and convenient routine. A person with OCD may lock, unlock, relock the car door until he feels comfortable enough to trust that the door is actually locked. However, someone without OCD may just lock, check, just may check the door handle once uh, and be satisfied with the car that is locked. Strive to use normal criteria to decide when to stop an activity instead of stopping when you feel comfortable. Force yourself to stop washing your hands or locking up your home or car before you feel comfortable. Very, very important statements here that's being made. Making this change can help reinforce the fact that your criteria for stopping ritual are the problem and prove to you that your discomfort, anxiety, and doubt can diminish spontaneously. Importantly, this technique can also show that you can tolerate the discomfort of resisting your rituals, even if doing so is pretty uncomfortable at first. 
So if any of all of you ever come here to Florida and meditate with me, and if I find out that you have OCD, you bet, you bet, I'm going to tell you to sit and sit through it when you want to go out and check your car, right? So you can see the application of sitting in silence and sitting meditation actually helps address most of these issues that people cannot sit still. It's the problem. People cannot sit still. Our most venerables have said that many times before. Those who cannot sit still have issues. It is our job to investigate what those issues are. Allowing your mind and body to do their own thing. Complete control of your thought and body is impossible. No one has it, not even highly trained doctors, athletes, monks, or psychologists. Counterproductive. Okay. Attempting to completely control or censor your thoughts results in more thoughts and sensation you were trying to get rid of. You may feel more out of control as a result of trying to control the uncontrollable. Undesirable. Okay, complete control of your thought and body is undesirable. Being able to completely choose the thought that enter your mind effectively puts a stop to any originality and creative problem solving. Being in control of your body would almost certainly result in your demise after all. Do you really know how to run a body? Question mark. Normalizing physical sensation, emotion, and unpleasant thoughts. OCD can lead you to focus too much on thoughts, emotion, and physical sensation. These problems can lead you to attach undue importance and meaning to your physical sensation, emotion, and upsetting thoughts. OCD leads you to guide too much by emotional distress. If I feel anxious about a fire, that must mean that checking that all the plug sockets are off is the right thing to do. OCD also leads you to attach too much meaning to normal, unpleasant thoughts that intrude to your mind, like having a thought that must mean something important. I must, I have to stop those thoughts. OCD finally leads you to misunderstand physical normal sensations. If I feel a urge to pull my car into oncoming traffic, I must be at risk of doing just that. Your problem isn't the content of your thought, the feeling in your body, or the emotional distress you may experience. However unpleasant and unwelcoming they may be, your problem is your belief that these experiences are abnormal. People without OCD experience the same intrusive thoughts and urge that you do. They just let them go more easily. To help yourself overcome your obsessional problem, take the view that your thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations are normal. When we get into Vipassana meditation, when it comes to Vedana, which is uh, sensations and feelings, you know, is it pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? That is when you guys will be more in tune, more aware, as it relates to about how you feel. Um, pleasant and unwelcoming, um, the feelings in your body and the emotional distress that you may be experiencing. Vipassana meditation just does, it just addresses a lot of these things. Um, and so hopefully we get, we move along quickly, uh, particularly both the CBT and Buddhism and let me see the, this May. So hopefully, no, this is April, April. So hopefully the end of April, we can move into Vipassana, which is, I'm super duper excited. We have any questions so far, any confusion so far based on what I have read? All right, two more pages and we'll be done. Facing your fears, reducing and stopping rituals. This is called facing your fear and resisting the urge to carry out compulsions. It's called exposure and response prevention. There are two components. Exposure, deliberately facing up to those places, people, situations, substances, objects, thoughts, doubts, impulses, and images that trigger off your feelings of anxiety and discomfort. 
the response prevention is reducing and stopping the ritual and any other safety precautions that you adopt in order to reduce or potentially stop your reliance on ritual you must tackle your obsession head on to accomplish this you need to get better at tolerating doubt allowing your thoughts and images to come and go from your mind and be realistic about responsibility and yes you need to practice these skills you may make faster progress if you deliberately trigger off your upsetting thoughts and anxiety in a regular and consistent way Facing your fear when overcoming OCD is different from dealing with many other kind of anxiety problem because the object of your fear may be more internal than external. Putting up a firm resistance. To overcome an obsessional problem, you need to develop a list of your main fears as well as your typical ritual and safety behaviors. Keeping a daily record of frequency of the ritual you wish to reduce helps you keep track of your progress and motivate you to keep reducing. You can record the frequency on your phone or old school by a tally counter uh, when you've got your list. You need to systematically expose yourself to main fears while simultaneously reducing and dropping your ritual and safety behaviors. Stopping your ritual only when the opportunity arises is not sufficient to overcome your obsession. You need to incorporate deliberate exposure to your fears in order to get the practice that you need. In other words, seek out what is most typically avoid and don't do what you typically would do. Delaying and modifying rituals can also be helpful. Uh, delaying rituals. If you find stopping your rituals difficult, start off by delaying them for a few minutes. Gradually build up the time delay until you can resist a ritual enough, long enough for your anxiety to reduce on its own accord. Modifying rituals. If you can't gear yourself up to stop ritual entirely, then modify it. Instead of going full-blown version of a ritual, allow yourself to perform only a shortened version. For example, you normally vacuum every corner of a room. Try making yourself stick to the areas that you can see without moving any furniture or other objects. Overcoming OCD is supposed to be an uncomfortable experience. If you're working through the exercises in this chapter and not experiencing temporary increase in your discomfort, then either you're not exposing yourself sufficiently or you're not resisting your rituals sufficiently. If you plan to stop a particular ritual but end up doing it anyway, re-expose yourself rather than letting your obsessional problem win. If you have a fear of contamination, touch the floor to re-expose yourself after washing your hands. You may be tempted to... Okay, so you guys can see that dealing with problems head on. Head on. This, you, you know, and taking that courageous step to just do it, like the Nike sign, just do it. On chapter 20, on page 222 and 223, there is the responsibility pie chart there. I invite everyone to take a look at that. And of course, today's, today's um, review of OCD in the CBT book is only surface level awareness and should not be substituted as a full and comprehensive understanding of OCD and or treatment of it. Um, before we wrap up chapter 14, um, when to seek professional help. This is a checklist to determine whether an obsession or compulsion is normal or a problem for which you should seek professional help. Your obsessional problem are impacting on your physical health. Your obsessional problem are preventing you from leaving your home. Your obsessional problem are having a serious impact on your social and occupational life. Your obsessional problem are preventing you from caring adequately for your children. You've given self-help by earnest try, but are unable to overcome your problem. Your family doctor might be familiar with OCD, but you may be better off seeking out a specialist. Make an appointment with a psychiatrist for assessment. If your problem is so severe that you're housebound, you may be able to get a home assessment via community health, mental health outreach team. However, you may need to prepare yourself uh, going out of your safety zone into a hospital or a clinic. So some of the resources to seek professional help include psychologytoday.com. Uh, also, you guys can visit on YouTube Med Circle. Med Circle and also YouTube and Google um, OCD uh, 
treatments, um, evaluation treatments, and certified therapists in this particular field. Do we have any questions as we wrap up both chapters from all of you? Any of you? We have any new people that like to introduce themselves? I'm Tech. How are you doing, Tech? How old are you, Tech? I'm pretty. I'm pretty good. How are you? Good. You are how old this year? I'm 21. I turned 20. I turned 22 in December. Though. Oh, awesome! I mean, you can buy alcohol now, huh? Hmm. Uh, yeah. I don't drink like that, though. I don't drink like that, though. <laughs> what brings you to our Discord? Um, I literally, I was on TikTok, man. And I saw you on TikTok. Oh. And then I went to your, like, profile. Because I, I followed Discord. you for a minute. Okay. Um, and I went to your, like, link tree or whatever. Mm. And I was like, whoa, he's got Discord. I got Discord. So there I am. That's awesome. So, yeah, we invite people who are new to check the assignment, the left side of the assignment tab on the Discord to try to catch up to where we are in these readings as it is directly related to the scientific study of the mind in Buddhism. So anybody else have any questions on the OCD and the science of sleep? Any questions on Buddhism since I was able to finish a little bit faster than normally? I'll let you guys ponder for questions. Quiet group tonight. Goodness. Mm. You all can uh, discuss amongst yourselves if you like. Do we have any questions on Buddhism? I think everyone fell asleep in this chapter. Venerable, I did have a question. Um, like growing up, I noticed my mother um, washes her hands a lot. Mm. Um, and I think I kind of fell into that. Um, so I noticed today at shopping, when we were shopping, I wasn't really washing my hands a lot. But, like, if I saw, like, can of sanitizer, that I would use that. Um, I don't know. I wonder if that's an issue with me or a compulsion. Because, like, a month or two ago, I was showers a day. I think that had to do with, um, you know, like, a hot bath, a hot shower. Um, but I do believe that was becoming excessive. Um, because I don't think you have, like, you know, a good amount of activity, like, you know, your job is um, really physical or you're in manual labor. So I kind of find that interesting, um, you know, growing up, um, by my dad and like his family and his mother, a clean freak, and I am as well. Um, I do think there might be kind of some co uh, compulsion in like washing my hands like staying clean, being clean, like having a clean space. Um, I don't think it's bad to be organized, but to the point where like I'm reorganizing things is kind of weird to me, kind of strange or bizarre. I do think it can be sometimes my mania um, in regards to managing bipolar. Um, but I don't know. I think it's kind of weird. Yeah. It doesn't affect work, school, life, right? It's. I mean, I don't. I don't think shower twice a day is a is an issue. I don't. I don't see that as a clinical issue. Yeah. 
you know, and uh, um, washing hands. I is- don't think the hands either. I think in the past, maybe my hands. I think now, I don't know. I just think it's just being kind of um, maybe just kind of anal. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Sherry's still here? Oh, Sherry left, huh? Hmm. Anybody else? She said she had another she said she had another question for me, Sherry. I just told her to message me and then we can address it tomorrow. Oh, okay. Go back here, see if we have any questions. Hmm. Okay, so no no question. Ken's joining us. Ken's, are you new from here, in here? Yeah, I am. If you want to introduce yourself, uh, how old you are, and uh, what makes you come to our Discord? Yeah, I'm 24, and I also found you on TikTok. I was just going to lie, mm. and I heard about you having a Discord, so I just joined. Awesome, awesome. Okay. All right. So it seems like a nice, quiet chapter. Not everyone, I surprisingly, don't have any questions on OCD. Um, and so let's talk about the prevention of OCD and the prevention of a lot of mental health issues that we see and are studying right now. So that Buddhism can do that. Buddhism is that shield necessary to prevent a lot of these from happening, especially later in life. Your life will change. Right? Every five years, a person changes, and you want to establish, maintain an armor, a psychological body armor. I was a young man that grew up with a lot of these issues that is out of this book. That's why I believe in it, because it worked for me, it will work for all of you, and it's worked for many people over the past more than 40 years of research. I don't ever see myself relapsing back to my old ways and my old days of thinking, my old ways and my old days of uh, operating, my MO. And so I am asserting that you all keep this in mind as it will reinforce your unshakable faith and confidence in the teachings of the Buddha and how the teachings of the Buddha can protect you matter of fact it's something that Thai people say a lot may the Dhamma protect you it's one of the most very realistic sense in Buddhism is that the Dhamma can in fact protect a person from falling prey within their own mind about some of these obsessional compulsive intrusive thoughts um, it's just amazing and we we owe it to the Buddha the founder, the one and only historical Gautama Buddha, that he sat in silence and was able to identify a lot of these mental health issues, these mental health issues that now science itself is just now catching up to. And it's no wonder he's long gone, but when we Buddhist monks walk into a temple, our face is planted to the ground instantly. When we see the image of the Buddha, um, and uh, for forever indebted, as long as we are alive, to his teachings. Oh, we got Mr. Hindu joining us. Mr. Hindu, please introduce yourself. Oh, can I speak? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, I just joined from the TikTok. Mm. Yes, yeah. I just uh, joined from the TikTok earlier. I was gonna ask some questions about Buddhism. Sure, go go ahead. You can you can go ahead. Well, this one's more like for you. So, what Buddhism do you follow? Theravada, School of the Elders. Theravada. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. So, is that the like orthodox one? Is that like the first? Type of school or? Yes, the original. 
School of right, the nice. School of the Elders. Yeah. How, how old are you? When did you become a monk? Thirty-four. I actually invite you to read my biography on uh, YouTube. You can find me on YouTube, and my biography is yes. on there. Yeah, I'll read it for sure. Mm. And what are your thoughts on Patanjali? On what? As a Buddha. On Patanjali. What is what is that? Can you define that? Oh, Patanjali, you know the founder of Yoga Sutra? Potentially. Uh. Patanjali. Patanjali. The uh the yoga that's a separate that's a separate entity from buddhism yeah yoga yeah, no, is, yeah know, the yoga is founded in hinduism i'm a hindu i'm just asking him like what is his thoughts on him oh okay so, yeah, yeah yeah so any founders in the yogi philosophy any founders and uh yeah. in hinduism is wonderful and great mm -hmm as the Buddha himself first and foremost learned from the Hindu tradition. Um, we, we are also very indebted to the Hindu philosophy. Uh, I believe that there, it's very useful and that people should approach it with curiosity to see if the of any Hindu uh, philosophy and sub all of the sub practices under the branch of Hindu uh, just like Buddhism. Buddhism is just an umbrella, and there's also sub-branches of Buddhism underneath that umbrella. Um, and so, any founders in regards to Hinduism are great. Um, the, the yogi philosophy is still booming and spreading at a very high rate of speed. I think people are getting into shape. They're learning more about themselves. They're on the spiritual path. They're learning, learning about the chakras. Um, and everything that Buddhism has to offer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's cool. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. So, do uh, Buddhists, like your tradition, do you guys believe in a god or like no god? Because I've heard many Buddhists talk about like, some say they believe in a god, some say they don't believe in a god. So like, no god? No god. Correct. That 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 question was also answered at the beginning of this uh, of this recording, so you can actually go back to the recording later, as it was addressed earlier. Is that recording? Is that... It's recorded on all platforms: YouTube, Tik, uh, YouTube, Instagram, and both of the Facebook accounts. Yes. No God. And and whoever is asserting there's a God in Buddhism, well. I think they're just kind of lost. <laughs> yeah, okay. huh. Any yeah. more? Any more questions? Because yeah, I do. Have, I yeah, but thank you so much for answering my question. I'll let mm. the others ask now. Mm. Okay. Yeah, there is there is no God, and you know, it doesn't really not important whether God does or does not exist, as I asserted earlier. It's the way how we behave on this earth is whether or not we fear a god you know if you cheat lie kill and steal in this lifetime then yes like my dad said Mr. which means they're gonna pull your tongue out when you go to hell <laughs> my dad has a very unique way of describing yeah. hell so i live my life L let me tell you all since you guys are so inspired by the way how i teach and the way how i live my life is that i live my life as if all the gods exist I live my life as if Jesus Christ exists, Krishna, Vishnu, Gautama Buddha, you know, uh, Jane, Order, uh, just everybody who's gone before me, uh, they all exist, right? And so before I speak, before I talk, and before any of my actions are created and is carried out on this planet, I have to justify that first and foremost to myself, whether or not my action, speech, thoughts, and mind is true and correct and beneficial for myself and for all. So 
it, it is no wonder, right, that the TikTok is now 1. million followers is because it was meticulously and carefully and mindfully thought out through in, in a matter of seconds. In a matter of seconds, I can make a life and death situation uh, call. In a matter of a second, I can make a life-changing, altering choice. And it needs to be within the scope of the Dhamma. And when we look at the Dhamma, we can see that it is very comprehensive. It doesn't matter what philosophy or religion you believe in, that it is just so appropriate. And it is so universal. It's what the, it's what the universe would agree to. The universe would agree to the Buddha Dhamma. The Buddha Dhamma Sasana. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful when you live your life as if hell exists, all the gods exist, all of the lords exist, the laws of cause and effect exist, karma, rebirth, okay? Heck, reincarnation, go have at it. You know, when we live our life as if these things do in fact is waiting for us on the other side, you would live your life a lot more differently. Well, what happened when we live our life when no gods exist? So there, there was this other Theravada monk. Uh, forgot his name. But when I spoke to, what's his other name? Valerie, what, what's his other name? Uh, our wonderful atheist that asked me questions earlier this week or last week. He cited, he cited, he cited a Lung Po something. Lung Po is a... Great master, great teacher. Francesco. Yeah, Francesco. When he when he cited this yeah. this this guy in Thailand that asserted rebirth and karma, that he rejected the notion of rebirth and karma. Well, Bhikkhu bought he fired back and said, "Are you kidding? Doing that would just invite everyone to get a grenade launcher running around Thailand and just shooting it off like there's no consequences in the afterlife." So um, I frowned on that is because what he said and in his position as a long poor, it, it was an embarrassment to Buddhism. He should not be venerated. He should not be revered. And oh, you know, I, I should stop there. I shouldn't say anymore. <laughs> I'm cautioned to also <laughs> look inwards and not external. But Exercising, so, practicing right speech, venerable. Good job. It, it, it is right. <laughs> it, it is right speech. Oh, that's it why. It's, that's yeah. why Bhikkhu Bhati fired back uh, publicly, and it is memorialized for eternity. Um, and when Bhikkhu Bhati fires back, then that gives us permission to also fire back. But as a humble monk, I'm just going to reserve my rant. <laughs> um, should not dissent any further. But anyone who looks at this particular Lung Por is uh, uh, not beneficial for humanity. And a matter of fact, what he, what he said could incite additional violence without consequences. What he did could incite non-restraint, the practice of non-restraint. So if he ever wanted to be the most controversial monk and a monk unlike any other, congratulations, he made it on top of the list. Because no monk, including myself, who is now a world-renowned monk, uh, uh, just shakes their head on this particular matter. So that is why, you know, uh, for the sake of morality and ethical actions, speech, thoughts, and mind, one should always be, one should have wise fear for karma and wise fear for rebirth. Those are the two things that keep human within the scope of self-restraint. We have someone else too that's, we've got Nicholas joining us. Nicholas, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Nicholas and I'm 25 days here. So apparently the reason why I'm joining this call is also because that um, recently, or I would say last few years ago, about a year ago, you know, I, I joined, uh, I learned something from Christianity and I read uh, some things that 
they've done, you know, it's 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 wrong against uh some things they they've done, you know, it's wrong. Uh, which I feel it's against my belief, you know, as a Buddhist since since young. So that is why uh, I just want to learn more about Buddhism uh, through this chat, you know. And yeah, it's just something that I I, I can't pinpoint why Christianity they say that like you know karma karma is wrong or let's say um you know that they, they pinpoint that certain things that Buddhism believes that uh they they uh do this. That's why you know I feel frustrated. I'm so why uh, more from this this God? Yeah. If Christianity assert that karma is wrong. We would also counter that question with, is it also wrong to have committed all crimes, any sort of crime, heinous crimes, violent crimes, felony level crimes, punishable by life crimes, PBLs, first degree felony crimes, and capital life crimes, that one can commit all of those crimes, and at the moment of death, they can be forgiven so easily by and through what is that Valerie that when they give the bath and all their sins are washed away what, what's the term for that uh, baptism I don't I don't necessarily agree with that because um, I can't remember I think in the book of Psalms uh, Saul becomes Paul, I don't know, my, my grandma was talking to me about this. I didn't know that Paul was ever Saul. So Saul, God had changed Saul's name to Paul. And basically, now Paul was challenging Jesus and was saying, basically, like he was um, persecuting him. So I don't, I don't think, because I've spoken to my aunt, and um she grew up in the church my grandfather was a baptist pastor of like 20 something years in phoenix arizona and i don't think that's true i think they would say that they do believe in karma what goes around comes around because i have seen it in my own life um like when i was going to church those that have um caused harm or caused suffering um have suffered um, so I don't know who you spoke to, but I do believe that some Christians would say that karma does exist. Now, in the sense like Lord karma, I don't know, but in the sense that, you know, I think Christians would say that God is going to deliver justice. Is it going to be the justice that you want? I don't think so. It's probably going to be uh, his justice, or I like to say the universe's justice, because in regards to Buddhism, stepping away from Christianity just for a moment, in Buddhism, you're not going to cause harm. But what I like to tell people is you're not going to treat somebody horribly, and then they're going to show up on your doorstep with a gift. I, that's even besides, that's besides Buddhism. I think that's universal fact that um you not you're not going to get away with treating people horribly that is going to come back around and you are going to learn lessons and i think that a lot of people have this notion that karma is kind it's not kind karma is the lesson that you failed to learn the first time and so you're going to hopefully learn it the second if you don't then it's going to keep happening until you learn your lesson that's how I see karma. So, Nicholas, yeah, they, yeah. Are, are you Asian? You sound Asian to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm from Singapore, actually. So I I grew up since... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm born of Buddhist, actually. So, so, yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Singapore, huh? Singapore, not Malaysian. Singapore, Singapore. Yeah, so I think, I think karma is just one of the, the small little sections. I think uh, another, like, section is also because that like um I want them from um Christianity because mm -hmm. I attend my my Christian friend uh, invited me to their church and they said that you know other religions is wrong and only Christianity is right. I feel that kind of mentality, you know, is wrong. And 
and that is why I feel frustrated. Like, like, why would they say that that like there's only <laughs> one uh, right religion? I think this is something that I've always, you know, until now I still face issue. Hopefully, you can be able to enlighten me through through that. You know. Yeah, I've given many talks on it, so I invite you to to go on my YouTube, and there's a whole library of teachings to uh, for you to make your comparison and, and contrast. So, anyways, um, now we have a lot of issues in Christianity in regards to questions and assertions made by people who may not even be be Christians. But if we are, if we were ever to put both of them on the table of comparison and contrasting from a scientific standpoint, it would be a very interesting conversation. But again, uh, I invite all of you to, you know, do your diligent research um, before arriving to any conclusions, uh, both in Buddhism and Christianity. Obviously, I was once, you know, Catholic, and it just didn't make sense to me. And I just could not find the answers I was looking for. So in life, you just have to find what you're looking for. And if it resonates with you and you think you can achieve peace from it, operate and live and practice within that scope, then have at it. We also have Ken's joining us. Ken, would you like to introduce yourself? I think you're muted there, Ken. Okay, we have any more additional questions in Buddhism or CBT? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, what book do you recommend me reading to get started off with uh, Buddhism? What Buddhists Believe by Tamananda. What Buddhists Believe by Dr. Sri K. Tamananda. Sri K. Tamananda. What Buddhists okay. Believe. Yes. Jovaria, would you like to introduce yourself since you're new joining in? Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Jovaria, um, but I go by Joe. Um, and yeah, I'm 26. I just saw you on TikTok a few times. And I've been wanting to learn about Buddhism for a while. And you seem like a great resource. So I thought I'd join the Discord. I actually just made it an account. So I'm glad I was able to make it in here smoothly. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for flying United Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is, a, this, this is a very unusual <laughs> night where we have, a, we have four or five people from the TikTok merging over. Every other night, nobody wants to join. And tonight, a lot of people join. So do you have any questions right now in Buddhism that we can answer for you? I can answer for you. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's the new moon bringing people in here or something. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think I have any specific questions right now. Um, but I was enjoying listening. Anything in your life that pushes you towards this philosophy? Um... I think I've been resisting embracing peace for a while, and um, I think kind of on my journey to maybe like settling into that more, I've recognized like the things that have caused me to resist peace, mm. um, and I just find that um, I don't know, like, in I, just a lot of, I guess a lot of, like, Hindu and Buddhist philosophies that I've heard have been, have just resonated with me deeply, and I think, like, they were philosophies that I rejected previously just because of the way that I was raised, mm. um, but it is in my ancestry, so I'd like to learn more. What nationality are you? Uh, my family's from Pakistan. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Very good. So all of the new students, I invite you guys to uh, anyone that is interested in Buddhism um, to look at 
our resources that we have on the assignment and links tab on the Discord. Anyone who particularly only just want, are curious into Buddhism can visit the YouTube. The YouTube has been growing exponentially also. And I, I, I just started knowing how to classify videos into like, you know, like you create like a playlist and like everything about karma goes in karma. Everything about rebirth goes in rebirth. I just learned how to do that yesterday. So slowly I'm going to be merging videos over to playlists. And I also need to upload previous videos um, that I have given on Facebook Facebook, and then I saved them and then I just need to upload them on, on YouTube. So please don't stalk me, but I invite you to stalk all of my teachings and particularly uh, Facebook has a lot more than YouTube and I think YouTube's got I think 80 something videos right now and I try to keep them. If you listen to any of the podcasts, then it, it pretty paints a, a quite accurate picture comprehensively of Buddhism um, as much as possible. Okay, we have any more questions tonight? An interesting night. Okay, so I invite people who are new to, I'm, I'm very jubilant and uh, Happy to see new people coming in, J jubilant and happy to see people who are aspired monastics who have done a lot of research into wanting to practice the monastic ways. And um, I invite you all to approach this philosophy with a lot of curiosity, deep listening skills, take a lot of notes, ask a lot of questions. Don't. There's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, and um, you will inspire other people from your curiosity and questions. Uh, and we will address more tomorrow. We will meet again tomorrow at 7 p.m. Same time. And tomorrow is dedicated to the study of Buddhism only and not cognitive behavioral therapy. And we're moving, we're moving about learning the basics in Buddhism. And after we move... Past the basics in Buddhism, we will move into a little bit more advanced uh, level meditation, which is uh, we're going to go to Vipassana meditation. Those who are meditating, have been meditating, or is new to meditation, is recommended that you see the video on meditation for overthinkers on YouTube as you learn the four basic techniques of samadhi, samatha. Mindfulness of the breath. And if you practice diligently from now until we practice Vipassana, it will all make sense as you were able to connect the dots together. I strongly assert uh, that adamant that a person who does not study cognitive behavioral therapy, a person who does not practice Samadhi and jump into Vipassana would not be able to connect the dots. It would be very difficult to connect the dots. If there's active suffering in a person's life, then you would want to study CBT. Anything that depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, eating disorders, anything that is causing you peace in your life at this time is suggested that you go through the CBT program first. In additionally, trying out the basic meditation techniques and then later on Vipassana. Um, any students who are able to connect CBT, mindfulness of the breath, and Vipassana together are very close to enlightenment themselves. It worked for me. It will work for you. Um, and this is a very different approach um, versus any other teacher in the world who have been teaching Buddhism. I have found that lack of prior knowledge of CBT uh, is confusing to any new students, particularly students in the West and elsewhere around the world. Um, again, my job is to compress 84,000 teachings into the most simplest ways for you all to study. It makes sense to you. You can relate to it at your level of understanding. You can relate to it at your level and understanding where you're at in life at this age. Um, and we also have a new person joining us, uh, Om Omaria. 
Omara. Okay, Omira. Okay. Would you like to introduce yourself? I can't pronounce that. Hi. Um, it's Omira. Omira. Bailey, shut it. Omira. I'm sorry. Say that again. My dog was barking. Omira. 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 Yes. Got it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, please introduce yourself. How old you are? Um, where you're from and. What brings you to our Discord? Um, I am 20 and I am from Florida. Mm -hmm. Um, yesterday I was so lately I've been really needing to reconnect and recenter. I opened Tech Talk and you were live and I joined it and I decided to check out your channel and I came across one of your videos and you had the Discord link. Mm. And I clicked it, and here I am. <laughs> so, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm looking to grow in spirituality, and I am getting a call, so I'll be right back. <laughs> sure. Mm. What was the meditation you said to study before Vipassana? Meditation for overthinkers on, um, on uh, YouTube. Meditation for overthinkers. It's called that? Yeah, on my YouTube. Let me see if I can find it within my own. Um, Venerable, I just wanted to remind the students, tomorrow you wanted to discuss uh, the practice of non-self five aggregates and right speech, and then also three to five examples. Real life examples, is that correct? Yeah, I'm glad you reminded me, or else I would have just okay. fumbling around with my cheat sheet and have yeah. no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> I, I haven't gotten to it my, myself, but um, yeah, I'll be reviewing. I, I have some examples in my head. Actually, one happened today with my mother. And mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, we need to rephrase that question. I'm not mindful. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. For the overthinkers and how to tame the mind. Let me see if this is it. This must be it. Oh, for the overthinkers. Let's go live. And I've been grateful. All right, okay, I'll put this on the link. I found it. All right, so it's in the link. If you go on the link tab on the left, you will you will see it for the overthinkers. And so it does not mean that you are overthink. This is not specifically addressing any or all of you that are overthinkers hey i think we all are overthinkers right we always our minds always jumping but as i was addressing oh, for overthinkers and how to tame the mind i uh, gave the four techniques of mindfulness of the breath um and uh i invite for those who are new to meditation to look at that and practice it you want to you want to at the rate that we are progressing Hopefully you guys are meditating three to four times a day and every opportunity you have to practice mindfulness, you do so. And if you want to progress fast in this program, I suggest you put everything away and that you should listen religiously every single day to catch up. So if you are new joining us, you know, you need to refrain from, I suggest you refrain from existing rap videos, movies, whatever it is that you young people are doing, and to prioritize the study of the demo so that you're on point uh, of what it is that we're studying. So you don't want to walk in halfway and like, what, what are we talking about here? I, I don't get it. <laughs> so tomorrow we will reconvene at 7 p.m. Florida time. Uh, the We will study the five aggregates, which has a lot to do with how we experience right now in this present moment and that's it that's all that's all that's all there is our the five aggregate makes up your experience right now simply put and it is in constant flux of change it's a very very necessary very important teaching in buddhism you must understand the five aggregates so anyone who got free time tonight can look up the five aggregates in buddhism on google and youtube and hopefully tomorrow when we start our session, you guys can educate all of us before I speak.
and uh, your job is to impress the teacher based on what you have found. Take, give it a shot. Um, it's the best way to learn is to teach others. So we don't have any more additional questions. Yeah, what time is it for you tomorrow? Like, so I can convert the time. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Florida time. What time, sorry? 7 p.m. Florida time. Put that in Google. Eastern. 7 oh, p.m. Okay. Florida Sorry. time. New York it's time. Eastern. Yeah, Eastern. And okay. oh, Omaida, I'm, I listen, it's, it's a name I'm going to get wrong. So, Omaida, do you have any uh, questions so far before we, we wrap up the, the session? Um, no, no questions so far. Okay. All right. I gave, I gave recommendation advice, um, earlier. So I invite you to go back. Oh, we got a bunch of people coming in and then let, let, let me take this last person. Emperor Cotton just joined us. Could you in, in, introduce yourself real quick? Uh, okay. Uh, I did not know. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be Hello. Uh, my name is uh, actually Thomas Cotton. I just, just go by average. It's just a little game. Uh, I'm 27 years old. Oh, I'm sorry, 20. Yeah, 27 years. 28. 27, 28. So I went to service a little nervous. Um, I live in Dallas, Texas. And I was invited uh, just because you were speaking on uh, meditation. And that's something that scheduled as well. So always listening, always learning, always observing, and I'm uh, um, just grateful to be here as far as now in a matter of minutes. Very good. Awesome. 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 What a most interesting night out of all the chapters we have reviewed. Tonight we had seven, eight people from TikTok merging over very quickly. Thank goodness for all the Linktree, whoever made Linktree, pretty awesome CEO made life a lot easier those who are new are suggested to go back to this recording that is available on youtube instagram facebook the last 10 minutes i gave recommendations and suggestions for you all to catch up to our speed and uh, the study and practice of buddhism at uh, this time i'd like to conclude the sessions at 9 37 p.m florida time we will reconvene again tomorrow at 7 p.m florida time which is the same time as new york any additional questions can be forwarded to my messenger or you can type directly onto the group chat here on Discord uh, and see you all tomorrow. And uh, we welcome all of you to our Discord, our digital Sangha, our community. So may you all be well, be happy, be free, and always be healthy. And until the next time. Thank you, Venerable and Gazelle. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Peace.